Remember this? It's a Selectric typewriter, cutting edge in its time. Manufactured by IBM, one of America's legendary corporations, which this week reaches an historic milestone. Michelle Miller will do the honors. It's a logo known the world over. Three letters and a sleek, simple design. Representing one of the largest, richest, and most powerful companies in the world. It is also, you may be surprised to learn, one of America's oldest. The company that brought us into the computer age, helped put a man on the moon, and gave us, among other things, the Selectric typewriter, the universal barcode. Watson? What is Sauron? Sauron is right. And a machine that can beat humans at Jeopardy turns 100 years old on Thursday. Essentially, we've been doing the same thing for 100 years, and there's not a lot of companies that can say that. IBM archivist Paul Lazowitz says even in the beginning, it was about storing information more efficiently. And this did what? This was the equivalent of the central processing unit for our tabulating system. It began as the computing tabulating recording company, making time clocks, food processors, and this machine, the Hollerith tabulating system that recorded information as a series of holes punched on cards. Those punch cards would revolutionize and globalize American industry. Virtually every major enterprise by the 1930s was using systems like this, railroads, uh, retail, oil companies. In 1935, when FDR signed the Social Security Act into law, IBM was ready. We actually had to invent a machine that enabled them to do the Social Security account. The man who engineered IBM's meteoric rise was Thomas Watson Sr. He very intentionally, which I don't think many people before him did, he very intentionally created a culture at IBM. And IBM's culture, says Watson biographer Kevin Maney, would become as recognizable as its name, adopted in 1924, and its iconic slogan, Think. IBM had this bizarrely quirky culture that the press actually couldn't get enough of. These guys all wore those stiff white shirts, legendary, right, and suits, and they sang company songs at meetings. We're the IBM go-getters all the live long day. We there were trips and conventions to reward top salesmen who were encouraged to write down their thoughts on this, the original ThinkPad. They'd be able to jot down notes to an inspiration whenever it came to them. And right here, he listed goals. Yeah, a little bit of motivation. During the late 1930s, Tom Watson Sr. was the highest paid executive in America, so he was sort of the Bill Gates of his era. But there was a dark side to IBM's global reach. One of its tabulating machines, on display at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., was used by its German subsidiary to help the Nazis identify and track Jews. Whether Watson himself knew about it is a matter of debate. Kevin Maney thinks not. Machines were already there. They were taken. There was no, the idea that there was anything more than that, any kind of collaboration, is actually grossly unfair. Is it fair to say that once he found out what was going on, he well, pulled his company out? It is fair to say that, yes, absolutely. In the 1950s, Thomas Watson Sr. handed over the reins to his son, Thomas Watson Jr., who would put all the company's resources into developing the world's fastest and best computing system. This uh, begins a new generation of computers. They essentially stopped R&D on every other product they were making and for two years just worked on this and spent what was the equivalent today of about $34, $35 billion developing this thing. If it wasn't this gigantic success, IBM was going to be ruined. Gigantic success doesn't even begin to describe IBM System 360. It was one of the machines that we used to help put men on the moon. And it basically helped IBM just absolutely dominate the computing industry for the next 20, 30 years. That domination didn't last forever. It was known as the giant. But yesterday, old number one reported giant second quarter losses of $8 billion. In the early 90s, overinvested in mainframe computing 
and overtaken by Microsoft and Apple in the personal computer field, IBM laid off tens of thousands of workers. Kevin Maney, who was a technology reporter for USA Today during that time, says it was a question of survival. Only way to save the company was to essentially chop it in half. IBM survived and is actually back up to the size that it was when it had to cut all those people. IBM has lived this hundred years by constantly reinventing itself. Bernie Meyerson is vice president of innovation at IBM. As a young engineer, he came up with a smaller, more powerful computer chip. The funny thing is it was a basic piece of science we did back in the early 80s that found its way in 2010 into literally every computer now that's out there, literally every handset. There's a bit of it almost everywhere. The kind of innovation Meyerson hopes that will keep IBM around for the next 100 years. IBM had this unending optimism about science and technology. We put the money into this and it's going to create some new and great stuff. And you know, so far it always has.